Right, so they they put my talk the second the second slot. And I'm gonna get you guys to sleep anyway. So just relax. It's gonna be fine. Anyone know the command for this for to set the resolution? Mode? Was it mode? No. Twelve eighty. Let's try it there. Uh -huh. Let's try this. All right. Okay, uh, my, my name is Boris, I work for SUSE, and um, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to try to talk about the entry paths in a kernel, and one of the best ways to imagine that is just think of uh, user processes like kids, and they play, and all of a sudden they break something or something goes wrong. And then mommy has to go and intervene and fix stuff. This is what the kernel does. This is mommy. <laughs> By the way, uh, this talk wasn't my idea. It was my, my manager's idea. So if you don't understand something, that's his fault. And uh, <laughs> if you understand something, you can thank me. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, I think I have a lot. I don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to try to not talk about everything. Just... Uh, the main stuff. Uh, there are a bunch of reasons to enter the kernel. System calls, interrupts, and architectural exceptions. And uh, this talk is going to deal be dealing only with system calls, but the other ones are just for for later, for other talks. Uh, there's interrupts, NMIs, epic interrupts. There are software interrupts you can just generate by executing an instruction, int. And the byte afterwards is the interrupt vector you can you want to uh, uh, activate. And there's external interrupts which are hardware generated. They happen from some outside logic. There's also architectural exceptions. For example, when you execute code in the machine and something out of the ordinary happens, you need to handle it. And the way to handle it is you execute the exception handler. And all these architectural exceptions are defined by the architecture. I don't know about the others, but x86 defines a bunch of them, 30 something. And um, there, there, there are three different types. There are faults, traps, and aborts. The way to think about this is faults are precise in the sense that when you get an exception, you actually get a chance to handle it. And that happens because the fault gets gets reported before the instruction that causes the fault uh, continues. So you can go fix stuff up and then re-execute the instruction. And there's also traps which happen after the instruction is executing. So actually the traps change architectural state. And there's also aborts like machine checks, for example. They're asynchronous. They can happen at any point in time. And machine checks not always can be reliably restartable means you get a machine check and that's critical enough so you cannot continue execution, you have to die. But yeah, this is all details. You can read it up. Um, 
just to brush up on uh, how we do interrupt or exception handler entry, there's an interrupt descriptor table, and the interrupt number or the exception number indexes into that table. And depending on what type of interrupt descriptor it is, it is an interrupt gate or a trap gate, this is all part of segmentation. Uh, you push stuff on the stack right here, and you execute the handler. And if you do a higher privilege level switch, you switch to a exception handler. For example, in the kernel, you push a little bit more on the stack, like, like stack segment and, and stack pointer of user space stack pointer. And then the other things you push normally on the stack, and then you execute the handler. This is a picture I stole from the intermenu. Oh, that's not good. Let's see. Well, Oh well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that's that's the whole slide, right? And since we're going to talk about segmentation, just a forty-five second refresh. Uh, segmentation is a way of describing continuous ranges in memory, and they are described by things called segment descriptors. And those segment descriptors are selected by segment selectors and you select them by indexing into a descriptor table. So you have tables full of descriptors and each descriptor describes a segment. And uh, when you select them, you load them into segment registers and there are six segment registers, six user and four system. This is just a, just a, you know, the 10,000 feet view. Uh, that's a segment descriptor. You have address and segment limit and a bunch of bits that describe what it is. For example, this is the long bit. If it's set, it means the descriptor is a long mode descriptor. And if it's not set, it's a compact mode. And there's the default operand size bit. If it's one, it's 32 bit descriptor. And if it's zero, it's 16 bit legacy descriptor, and so on. Right. So let's go to the syscalls thing. Uh, in, in legacy mode, you call syscalls through all these different type, types of descriptors, four types, call, blah, blah. And there's a huge overhead from the protection you do with, with segments. For example, every time you need to do a syscall, you need to load the selector and descriptor into a segment register, and you need to do that even with flat mode when, you, we have, when you've set the segment basis and limits to the same. You always have to do it because you have to reload the descriptor on the descriptors in every call, like code segment descriptors and stack segment descriptors. And you do, do all kinds of checks. Like you check whether the selectors and descriptors are in proper form and whether they're, they're within the bounds of descriptor tables and so on and so on. And in long mode, this thing was simplified. There was a new uh, pair of instructions, syscall and sysret which are only one fourth of the clocks that the legacy call mode, uh, call method takes, but they require a flat memory mo model with paging and that's the case anyway in long mode because uh, in long mode you cannot go without paging. You predefined value, uh, predefined call segments, stack segment values and you eliminate a bunch of checks like for example, you assume the base and limits are unchanged and the only thing that changes is the current privilege level. It changes from three to zero, and when you sysret, you return back to user space, it changes from three uh, from zero to three. Um, these are controlled by a bunch of MSRs. For example, you the OS configures um, the code segment selectors and the stack segment selectors for the different instructions for sysret and syscall, and then it configures also the target address that you jump to when you execute a different type of syscall. When you execute 32-bit syscall, you jump 
to that address. And if you execute a 64-bit Cisco, you jump to that. And if you execute a 32-bit Cisco when running on a 64-bit kernel, you execute that one. And there's also a Cisco flag mask, which is a bit field of bits, which when set will be cleared when you execute Cisco. You're going to see that later. And this is, what, this is how we configure it. You just go and write the entry point for the Cisco 64-bit, you write it into that MSR, and the compatibility Cisco entry point, you write in that MSR. And you prepare the code segment and stack segment selectors. Right, and then you execute the Cisco instruction. This is what the microcode does. It just goes and writes in RCX the address of the next instruction, which basically is the instruction after the Cisco instruction. And what it does is basically increments it by two because Cisco is a two byte instruction. Then RIP gets the, offs the, the address of the Cisco entry point. That's from L star or C star, depending on whether you're in compat mode or long mode. And then R11 gets R flags, like the user space flags with the resume flag cleared so that when you go sysred, you can get a debug exceptions. Huh? I don't know why you know what RIP is. RIP? Uh, the instruction pointer. How many people know what RIP is? Well, it's like less than 50%. Well, the people have no idea what that is. Yeah. Yeah. I told you I'm going to get you to sleep. <laughs> right. So RIP is the instruction pointer. You basically load an address there and then starts executing from there. And then you clear the resume flag. The resume flag is just a flag that the CPU clears on every instruction retire. And when that bit is set, it means instruction breakpoints are disabled. And this is a, a way of a method of returning from the debug handler without, without looping in, uh, in, uh, forever in it. Oh, we don't have time for that. Right, and this is what we do. We just go and set the resume flag uh, and the, on the flag spit on the stack. Then also, also the same instruction Cisco, we just preset the selector from the MSRs. And if you dump that MSR here, you see that's uh, 10 hex and that's the kernel CS. We just switch to the kernel code segment. And then we force that segment to be read, readable executable 64-bit mode, and then we reset base and limit. Stack segment, we load the stack segment from the code segment plus eight, which is the next, the next descriptor in the descriptor table. These are hard-coded, hard which makes uh, everything simpler. That's why, for example, kernel CS is, 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 uh, um, is the second segment. And kernel DS, which is the stack segment, is the third, is the next one. Right. And this is the, the flags we clear when we execute Cisco, the trap flag, so that you don't single step the Cisco from user space. We disable interrupts. We reset the direction flag. The direction flag controls in which way you copy strings. We reset the privilege level so that the kernel can execute uh, input and output instructions from the uh, like in S, out S. And we reset the nested, nested task flag, which is uh, some remnant for, from 32 bit. And um, we also disable alignment checking. We clear RF to zero, and we set the privilege level to zero. And now we are in the kernel. And now we execute the RIP, which is entry Cisco 64. And when we execute that Cisco, up to six registers can be. Uh, up to six argument of the Cisco can be in registers. Rx gets the Cisco number and RCX gets the return address and R11 gets the saved. Uh, we saw that already. And these registers contain the Cisco arguments. If you compare this to the CABI, the only difference is RCX, the fourth one. But later in the code, we just sync it and we move R10 to RCX so that, so that, um, they match the CABI and you can call functions directly. 
with the Cisco arguments. And we don't save, we don't, we don't touch those registers so they are coldly preserved. We're gonna save them in case we need to, we need the full frame, but we're gonna see how we do that later. For example, I just stopped the QMO guest at stat and uh, if you dump the registers, you see for example, RX has the Cisco number four, that's stat. And uh, RIP is the entry Cisco 64, you just have to trust me on that. <laughs> RCX is the call RIP, that's the user space RIP, that's the next RIP after the Cisco. So in user space you call Cisco, and after you return, this is the RIP that gets loaded. R11 gets the flags, the like R flags, and two arguments that Cisco gets, path name and buffer. And they, they are in R, RDI here and RSI. And right, the code segment is 10, as I showed before, and the stack segment is the next one, 18. Then we do uh, swap GS and safe, on safe stack. This is a single instruction called swap GS. We just swap the GS space. Okay, in long mode, most of the segmentation is gone because it's just not needed. But only two segments are still usable, uh, uh, two segment registers, GS and FS. And swap GS is a in single instruction that does need uh, um, memory operands or, or, or operands in registers in which you can switch the base of the GS base, like the base address of the GS segment with a kernel GS base, which is in this MSR. And for example, what happens, this is before the swap GS instruction, and GS is cleared, and after there's a kernel address, and if you grab DMS for that kernel address, that's the base address of the per CPU area, and when, you, when you've seen per CPU instructions, how, how they get executed, they, they are, address through the GS register. And in order to access per CPU data, we need to do swap GS, and this is what happens here. And then we go and save the user space stack into a per CPU variable, that's the RSP scratch. That's our user, sp our, our user space uh, stack pointer. And if you wanna go and see what's there, we just see it's a relative address, and the per CPU area starts here. We sell that and we add, add it to the start, and if we dump registers, oh, if you dump that area, you see this user space address, and that user space address is the user space stack point. Okay. Then we go and move the kernel stack to RSP, and now we have a kernel stack. Like after this instruction, we have a kernel stack, we can execute everything else. And the kernel stack is is part of the TSS struct, and I'm gonna not gonna talk about it because this is just too much data, too much details. It's basically a struct that contains all the different privilege level stacks of x86, and uh, the CPU zero stack is in part of TSS. It was part of the TSS in 32-bit and in long mode, it, it was just preserved there. And then we go and say trace RQ is off, so we trace when we enable or disable interrupts, and this is done by calling another another uh, assembly function, which is a so-called punk. Basically, you stash the colleague clobbered registers, the registers which the the function that's calling this function is gonna maybe touch. We stash them away so that they can they they don't get clobbered, and then. Then we call the C function, and this is this mechanism of thunking. Actually, you know the real reason for the thunk uh, function that we call? Yeah. Because we could call C direct. Uh, yeah, you can. Thunk is uh, the new warning that GCC does about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the real reason why we call the thunk program is because the new warning that, well, GCC has a new warning now that uh, detects the um, uh, built-in return address, anything other than zero, uh -huh. where it could be one or two or three. Right. 
uh, the tracing infrastructure uses one or two yep. for certain calls that if you don't call, because this sets up a, uh, a frame pointer, mm -hmm. that uh, a built-in return address of more than one or two would actually go beyond the frame and crash the kernel. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we knew this a long time ago, but now GCC warns about it. Yeah. Kind of thing. So yeah. there's patches that quiet that because things like this yeah. are in place to protect the situation. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, That's yeah. So, but this thing is old. This is like from 2000 something. But we detected it back then. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so we have a kernel stack now, and we mark that we that interrupts are disabled, and then we construct the PT registers on stack, basically in case some function we're going to call later in the Cisco handling path needs user registers, we construct, construct all those registers on stack, we just push them there. Um, that's the user data segment because the user data segment is the sex segment, and then the user stack pointer, we just saved, we just push, flags, code segment, rip, and the rest. And we don't save those registers because they're colleague clobbered, we're not gonna need them. And the interesting thing here is we just prepare a full IRED frame in case we have to do IRED, because Cisco normally returns with SysRED, but we can do some funky stuff in the Cisco path and get preempted or get some uh, uh, thread info work, and then we're gonna need the full registers. We, and we, when we do the full, when we save the full registers, when we get rerouted somewhere else, returning with sysred is a little bit problematic and maybe not that safe. So we're just gonna do in return with iret. Even even if iret is the instruction you return from interrupt, that's why it's called irets. And this is the iret frame. This is what iret expects on the stack. When it gets executed, basically, you need to have the stack segment and the return stack pointer when you return to user space and R, user R flags and the code segment and, and the rip. So that when you execute IRET, you need, you can, you can continue where you left off. And this is, this is what we, we would just prepare here in case we have to, re because we're going to return with it anyway at some point. And then we go and test what kind of work we need to be doing. For example, this is a, a mask of TIFF bits, like thread info bits that you're going to see later. And whenever one of those bits is set on the thread info, which is on the kernel stack, John was talking about it, whenever one of those bits are set, you're going to have to do work on Cisco entry. So when you enter Cisco, you do some additional work, not only the Cisco. For example, if Cisco's, Cisco trace is set, for example, uses the user space process is set, has set ptrace Cisco, has executed ptrace Cisco, means he wants to examine the Cisco's the Cisco arguments of the of the of the trace C. You have to go and do some work. Same thing with Cisco MU because, for example, you don't, user mode Linux emulates the Cisco's of the trace C's of the trace C. If Cisco audit is set, that's Cisco auditing. There's a huge daemon called audit D and a bunch of user space as a complete use space framework for that, or SecCom, secure computing, or no hertz for context tracking when you exit to, uh, and to user space and return. Basically, if any work needs to be done on Cisco entry, we have to jump to the slow path. And we go and say, okay, we're gonna mark interrupts enabled now, and that's what we do here. And we enable interrupts, which is basically SDI, set interrupt flag. And it is a macro because it's a wrapper for parvert, and parvert is a yeah power virtualized guess. And we land here. This is the fast path because we saved not we didn't save full registers, and we saved some time with, and and resources by not saving all registers, and that's why they call it fast path. Basically, we go and check whether the Cisco mask is zero and with uh, is all once, and we do that because. If we support X32 ABI, that means 32-bit uh, with, with the additional eight registers, uh, user space sets bit 30 to say that I'm executing a 32 X32 bit uh, X32 Cisco, and we have to clear that bit before we we look at the Cisco number. And this is the commit. If you're more interested. 
Okay, so Rx contains the syscall number, and it's basically it's we index with Rx into the syscall table, which is produced at build time. And we go and do this syscall table, Rx, and offset by eight. But some of the syscalls need all registers, full PTRX. So what we do there, we just call a stub, and the stub is stub PTRX 64, and um, the stub checks whether we were on a fastpad. So were we executing a fastpad Cisco? And if yes, we're just going to go and push the rest of the registers, and the rest of the registers are those here, those here, like RBP, RBX, and R12 to R15. We push, push the rest on, on the stack so that we have a full PTREX frame, and then we execute the slow path. And the slow path is just a C function, do Cisco 64. And that's the same thing here, but in a C. Right. So we execute the Cisco, we're done with it, and then we just go and retest. Do we need to do some more work on exit from the Cisco now? And if not, we just go and see, okay, have we, do we have any locks held before we exit the user space? Because we don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. I mean, it's obvious. Then, we're gonna, then we say we're going to enable interrupts. We restore rip, that's the user space rip we have, we're going to, we're going to ex return to. Our flags, restore the rest of the registers, and that's the user space tag pointer, and we do sysred64, uh, sysred. So we are back in user space, and that's the fast path. But in case you have to do some ex exit, exit work, like on exit after the Cisco is done, you go to the, down the slow path. For example, if race happens and you set sick pending, you have a pending signal. So we were on a fast path and we have to do exit work, so we have to save we have to save all those other registers because they are coli preserved. That means the function that gets called preserves our registers, so we have to save them. That's what this macro does. And then we go and call Cisco return slow path. So that right here. And because, because we're going to return on the slow path, which does sanity checking, the exit work, like tracing and auditing. And for example, if you audit the Cisco's, you audit them before the Cisco and after. And then you rejoin the, that's the, the return path that gets rejoined. And then, then there's this new thing that came this year, probably, yeah. Opportunistic sysred. Basically, the problem is IRED is really slow because uh, it's in microcode and does a bunch of checks. And most of the time, you don't need those checks because most of the syscalls, they just don't touch PDRX. They just return. They just do whatever they want and return without touching the registers. And the gain we get if we return with sysred instead of, instead of IRED is about 80, 80 nanoseconds. And that's probably not a lot, but if you do a gazillion syscalls per, per second, that adds up. So you probably want to, I mean, it's a fast path. You want to make it as fast as possible. Uh, uh, it's microcoded, so I don't know. It depends on the CPU architecture. No, 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 no. Uh, the one fourth is one fourth of the clocks for syscall compared to syscall in legacy mode. Like in legacy mode, you did call blah. In in long mode, you do syscall, and the syscall number is in RX. What that is normally we used to return with IRED. We still do. I mean, if we touch frames, we touch PDRX or something, we do some some auditing stuff. We return with IRED, but IRED is microcoded. And I mean, SysRed is also microcoded, but SysRed has a lot less checks. And IRED is a return from interrupt, so you have to restore more stuff. It's just more work. And I mean, I don't know what, so that. Where do you get the 80? Huh? What? Where do you get the 80? You said 80 yeah, I was about to exactly say that. So Andy Lutomirsky did some micro benchmark. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the the code is not a 
big problem to execute it. I mean, it's it's sim it's simple. So actually, you can do it. That's why that's why we did it. Yeah. Um, I seem to remember that uh, IRET was the only way to atomically uh, set STI uh, on return, and it was a problem yeah. uh, if we use this right instead. I skipped over that. Let, let me explain it. So basically, imagine you, you're returning from, from a debug exception, okay. and the resume flag, you clear the resume flag, and the resume flag is cleared by the CPU at each instruction. So this is the IRET instruction. You, you execute it, and the resume flag is, uh, no, no. You get a debug exception at the instruction before IRET that instruction completes and the resume flag is cleared. So when you execute IRET now, the CPU is going to clear, uh, RF is clear already and you're going to get another debug exception at the same instruction. And the thing what IRET does is it has a one instruction window where it just ignores the RF bit and the TF bit too. For the same thing with, with when you enable interrupts on x86, when you, when you do ST, STI, and interrupts were disabled before that, it does the same thing. It actually doesn't look at the interrupt flag. Because if you enable interrupts, and er you're going to get the same interrupt in the interrupt handler. And so the, the STI you perform before SysRed uh, protects the SysRed? Well, the problem is SysRed doesn't do that. That's why you're going to see. You're going to see. Yeah, let, let me let me show you. For example, if if we if we here if we have RF or TF set, we cannot return with sysred because this is exactly what the problem is. Uh, you can do the address, move the address in RCX, and RCX is the return rep, and you go push flags, and then you <coughs> pop R11, and then you you return here, and you're not going to go past this this label just because SysRed doesn't do that. I mean, it's a hardware thing. Okay. All right, so what we do is just go and test whether RCX is equal to RIP. I mean, RCX contains the user RIP, and the other RIP is the RIP that's the on, on the IRED frame that we save too. So if those are not equal, we return with IRED. We also check whether the RIP we're going to return to is canonical. Canonical means the first 16 bits are either ones or zeros. And Intel checked that. So if you sysred on Intel with a non-canonical RIP, the thing GP is in kernel space. But you control you control the, the stack and that's a security issue. And um, that's, this is what this check does. I mean it can happen. AMD doesn't do that. Um, we talked about this one. There's a one instruction, one instruction shadow where IRED doesn't look at those R flag bits and STI doesn't look at, at the IF bit when IF was zero. So when interrupts were disabled. Right, and then we check the stack segment, whether we, whether we return to the user stack segment. And if that have, if that, if all these checks pass, we restore the registers, so we re return with sysred. <coughs> but if we cannot do that, we have to do IRET. I mean, one of those fails. Uh, one of those checks failed. So we swap JS again. We restore. I mean, we had to save the full regs, the full registers here before that. So we have to restore them, and we do that. And then we restore the remaining registers, and then we remove. All, all the whole PT Rex thing from the stack, and we leave only the IRET frame because this is what IRET is going to expect on the stack when it executes. We also kill the syscall number, and we jump to the native IRET. That's the label that executes. On there, and this is this is another funny thing that's called ESP fix. That's a workaround for a hardware problem, or maybe a, not a problem, but like. The hardware designers didn't think about it at the time. What happens is when we return to a 16-bit stack segment, so you execute a syscall and then you return to a 16 to a, to a to a 
to a legacy process in user space. What happens is IRET restores only the lower word of the stack point, only the, f the, the first 16 bits. But the upper word leaks, and you leak kernel stack. And we test that by checking whether we're returning to a stack segment in the local descriptor table. This means, are we returning to a task that has a private stack segment? Are we returning to a task to a task's stack pointer? And if we do that, we know it's a, it's a user space stack. And how we fix that, we have a per CPU mini stacks and they are very small, like only 64 bytes, just one cache line. And they are mapped 128,000 times. So you can support 120K max CPU, so we are prepared. And they're mapped 64K apart, so that there's a stripe that jumps over the bits that get leaked. And uh, on IRED, we just copy the, the frame we're expecting, the IRED frame, we copy it to the <laughs> mini stack, and then we return return with with that uh, yeah we return with that RSP and because those RSPs are read only mapped we also handle the case where IRED could general do a general protection fault and because they're read only the general protection fault causes this thing to be escalated into a double fault and we handle that on its own stack and a known stack like a separate stack is this thing called IST. You can have sev seven, yeah. You can have seven <laughs> separate stacks for different for different exceptions, which are critical and should run on their own stack. And one of them is uh, double fault, and the other one is machine check, and yeah. And then we do the fix up in the double fault handler. So what happens here is we just we have a writable ESP address and a read on read only stack. ESP fix address. And we, this moves the IRED frame to that writable address, but then we copy the alias address into RX and then put that in RSP and IRED returns with that, with, with that pointer into RSP. So we leak something that, that we know already. Okay, and then, yeah, so this, this was the IRED pad, and then when we return with SysRed, it does a lot less checks. For example, it is a uh, CPL zero instruction gets executed only in, in privilege level zero, and it sets the privilege level to three when it returns, and it does only those things, like it says the code segment selector back to the six, SysRed code segment selector, which is the user CS, user code segment, resets base and limit in case something set it, and um, it loads RIP from RCX. This is the user RIP we saved before when we execute syscall. In compat mode, it does the same thing with the only difference. Like here, it reads the third segment, plus 16, and and in compat mode, it reads like two before that, the sysred CS. Resets base and limit, and loads rip with ECX because we're returning to a 32-bit process, which is ECX is zero extended, so there's no leakage there. And for both modes, we enable debug exceptions and disable virtual 8086 mode, which is uh, some x86 legacy stuff. And we also can return to a normal tube process in protect mode, the same thing. And we also, in, with the difference that we enable interrupts here. And in all cases, the sysred code segment is the, 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 the one in the middle. So sys, sysred CS is the fourth. Sysred SS is the plus eight, the fifth. And sysred CS, plus 16 is the second, and this is what it all means. This is why they're, they're hard-coded. Hard it has to be, have to be uh, 
in this order. And if you look at it, sysred CS is 23, which is the user 32, user 32 bit CS multiplied by 8 plus 3. It's 35. Okay. That's it. You can wake up now. <laughs> Questions? Uh, do you still see some 16 uh, bits uh, applications in the wild? Yeah. So this, is, this is why the fix was done. So it's, so it's still not possible even after, because it's been two years maybe since the ESP fix, I guess something like this. Something like that, yeah. And uh, so we still cannot uh, disable 16 uh, bits by default. No. It was disabled before, before the ESP fix. Yes. We were just, I think it was DAS EMU or something that mm -hmm. did that, and it wouldn't work, it wouldn't run. Okay. And now it works with the ESP fix. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs>